series in Hebrews, and the reason for that is because it's been a little while since we've been in our series in Hebrews, so that would be the correct the uh, correct uh, reason, I suppose. But uh, I hope that you can, uh, as we just do a little review this evening, hope that you can uh, come up with uh, an overview or an overall understanding of the letter to Hebrews. I know that over the weeks we have reviewed a number of things. It's really important particularly for biblical contextual interpretation of the scripture. It's really very important to uh, know a lot of the background of a context for a book. And Hebrews is probably um, it's probably one of the preeminent examples of that. If you don't understand to whom Hebrews is written, and if you don't understand perspective for why uh, the warning passages are written and explanations are written, man, you come up with some really wacky doctrines, and people have. There are books, thick, large books, with wacky doctrine just because people don't know much about the letter to the Hebrews. And you know the titles is really, really important for Hebrews. Uh, you ask some, some of the things that uh, our, our recent trip doing the missionary journey of the Apostle Paul asked some of the significant things about it. And I had several significant takeaways that I'll share next week. But one of the significant takeaways was that we really got to see how that God used the Apostle to the Gentiles to reach the Greek world. And as you read the letters and you stand in the places, and even in particular, Mars Hill, and you see the way that Paul was really explaining things to people from their Greek perspective, you really understand that, the, that what Paul meant when he said to the Jews, became I as a Jew, to the, um, and he, let's see, how's that go? It's Charlie, quote it for me. Can you quote it for me? I become all things but to all men, that I might by all means save some. And you really see the Greek perspective. Well, Hebrews is written, many think by the Apostle Paul, though that would be interesting because Paul didn't write anything particularly addressing only Jews ever. Uh, sometimes he addressed Gentile churches, but he never addressed Jewish churches uh, particularly. But he could have. He could have been one of the, he could have been the, the person the Holy Spirit used to author Hebrews. But one of the things we know for sure is that the Holy Spirit is the author of Hebrews. And so Paul is writing this, or not Paul, but the Holy Spirit is writing this letter uh, to the Hebrews. And it is a very, very different kind of a letter than what would be written to the church at Rome, which would be Jews and also to the Greek written to. But then Galatia, which would be largely Gentile, then Corinth, which would have been um, uh, very, very almost uh, completely Gentile, uh, to the Philippians, where there wasn't a synagogue there, in, in, in Corinth, there was a synagogue. I saw the, some of the inscriptions from the, the doors over the uh, synagogue in Corinth, but there wasn't a synagogue in Philippi. And so those perspectives would have been largely different. Why do, why do we say that? Well, because if you understand who Paul's writing to, you don't take the explanations and the warnings out of context. But oftentimes today, because we are so westernized, we really look at things from a perspective of what we've grown up knowing. So keep this in mind. The early church, was everything was brand new in concept to them, wasn't it? I mean, I grew up, you know, I grew up with people having to just say, you know, the church is, is people, not a building, right? How many of y'all ever heard that? Mm -hmm. The church is not a building, it's people. Because I grew up passing churches. There's a church here and a church there and this church and that church. This last week, my mom was talking about a church building outside of town. Remember going by this church? And so, so we're used to the concept of what a church is, but in the first century, it didn't exist before that. And so keep in mind as you're writing to Hebrews that you're writing to people who we assume most of which would have been religious, many of whom possibly were Pharisees, but they certainly culturally were very, very connected to Judaism. And so as they're considering going back from following the Lord Jesus, they're going back into something they're familiar with from something which they had only recently become familiar with and didn't know anything about before that. Um, Hebrews helps us to understand dispensationalism. It's not a bad word. Uh, matter of fact, if you don't mind, 
We haven't read in our text yet. We'll put your finger in chapter 10. But if you don't mind, let's just read the first couple of verses of Hebrews. Um, God, who at sundry, and uh, that, that word is just means many, uh, many portions or many times, at sundry times, and in divers manners, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. So, now, what does that mean? Well, it means God used to speak to us by the prophets, but how does God speak to us now? How has God recently spoken to us in the letter to the Hebrews? By his Son. Jesus was not a prophet. I'm sorry to those who are under that impression, but if Jesus were a prophet, he, were, he would be a lying prophet. He said he was the Son of God, and if he isn't the Son of God, he certainly is a lying prophet, isn't it so? And so he's not as, as the Koran would teach, another prophet, or as many people thought he was in his day, he was what Peter understood him to be, and that is that he was the Christ, the Son of God. And so God spoke to us by Jesus. Today, you and I are spoken to by what? By God's Word. But see, this is all new. We don't have the letter to Hebrews until it's written here. And so the Bible talks about that. The foundation of the church is Jesus Christ, the cornerstone, and, or, and then the foundation is the apostles and the prophets. The prophets would be the Old Testament of the Scripture or the Old Covenant. And the apostles would be the New Covenant. And that brings us to our context today. I, I'm sorry we cannot review the different warning passages and the different uh, material in Hebrews this evening. We will, when we summarize in a couple of weeks, when we finish our study in Hebrews, we'll, we'll, go, all the, we'll go through a complete summary. Matter of fact, the last message will be a summary message and to hopefully give us an overview for Hebrews. Uh, we're in chapter 10, and we're going to look at the new covenant. So this is the covenant, verse 16. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now, where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, and having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised, and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. And I want to read verse 26. For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. Father, please help us with our understanding as we look at this context and passage. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we've really come up to the place where we have seen that Jesus Christ, in contrast with the priest that you, you would be under if you went back into Judaism, Jesus is the high priest who is always sitting. And He is the high priest who isn't like the human high priest taken from a man, among men, needing for Himself... Sacri or needing sacrifices for himself because of his own sin. He's a high priest who never needs a sacrifice and who is able to offer himself for the sins of men in such a final and complete and perfect way that he, instead of standing who, and symbolizing the work of the priest never being completed, he is sitting in the Holy of Holies. He's sitting in the presence of God, having offered, with his, uh, having offered his own blood. And the Scripture says... There's no more sacrifice for sins. There remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. In other words, in this context, in this dispensation, we have once for all forgiveness for our sin. And so you can't go back, it's impossible to go back into a system where a guy's still standing and offering sacrifices and have God accept that. Why? Well, because you can't do that. 
a once for all sacrifice has already deleted or obliterated that, that uh, dispensation. Does that make sense to you this evening? In other words, uh, some individuals, not understanding this from a Hebrew perspective, would take chapter 6 and would take chapter uh, 10 and look at the warnings of it and say, well, there's a certain point when if you sin, you'll never be forgiven. You ever heard somebody teach that? Or they'll teach you could lose your salvation. And, uh, you know, and, and it's impossible to uh, crucify Christ afresh. Or it's, it's impossible, um, what is it, to renew them again to repentance, seeing you crucify Christ afresh. And what the Scripture is plainly stating here is that a once-for-all sacrifice can't be offered over and over again. It's offered once for all. And so what the warning is, is that the system of worship that offers sacrifices in the place of Jesus Christ is invalid. It's not valid. It doesn't work. You can't offer the sacrifice. So you go back into that system, you'll go to hell believing in that system. And I'm not talking to a saved person. So you go back into a system, even were there a Levitical priest today qualified, taken from among men, even were there a Le Levitical priest today, even if there were a temple, even if there were a holy veil, even if there were an altar, even if they were like they're supposed to, being offering, offering rams and bullocks for sacrifice, it would not work and those people could not be forgiven because there was a once for all sacrifice. So this evening, we'll, we'll look at the warning this next week. And by the way, you want to be here next Wednesday evening as we look at this warning passage. It really helps you understand a lot of ties together, a lot of things in Hebrews. But I want to look at the let us statements. The let us statements. Okay, so you all had your veggies this evening, had your salad. Let's have some lettuce right now, if you don't mind. All right, that was for you, Andrew. So go ahead and give us a good groan. And we will look at our let us uh, let us. Statements. Now, in verse 18, there is no more offering for sin. And then we have the therefore, and so the therefore begins the lettuces. Okay? <laughs> Having therefore, brethren, boldness, this is verse 19 of chapter 10, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way. By the way, religion doesn't allow anyone to go into any place with boldness, does it? Religion doesn't allow you to have access to a God with boldness. Uh, I witnessed last couple of weeks having to go to, you know, shrines. Witnessed people, you know, bowing and, and uh, genuflecting and, and uh, being afraid to go into places. And, and uh, they're going, you know, I, I understand reverence, but I, I for instance, I watched a, an elderly woman go and, and kiss an icon and a, and a man go in and, and uh, cross himself and, and uh, bow and in fear and then uh, kiss a box with a dead man's skull in it. And, uh, you know, there's just nothing about boldness and access in religion. There just isn't. And the way that you had to go into the temple, uh, the way that you had to offer to a high priest, man, you had to do it the right way. Friend, Jesus has done everything to make it's just fine. Jesus has done everything to make it right for us. And so what we see is that we can go into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Now, friend, don't take this and uh, mar or mess up uh, reverence for God. There's a difference between being disrespectful or casual uh, and having boldness, isn't there? In other words, you may have the right to something, but you don't have the right to be disrespectful about it. Right? Um, if, if, say, one of us were out of town, Melissa and I were out of town, right? And uh, we we're going to be gone for a couple of weeks, and so we say, hey, someone can come and they can use our house. And when you come to our house, you pretty much are expected to make yourself at home. Uh, if you need something, uh, you, you just need to ask for it. Tell us, hey, we need something. If we don't have it, we'll say, get it yourself, and uh, or we'll get it for you. Uh, but we're pretty casual about that. Uh, you can have anything in our refrigerator unless it's labeled. You know, this is for a particular meal or something. But if you get in our refrigerator, you can have anything that you like, don't can't you, Charlie? And uh, you can, you know, you can do, you know, you can come in and out of our place. But I want to tell you a couple of things. Um, 
my wife probably won't say much about it, but she likes people to take the shoes off when they come in and out. And if um, you have work boots on with tar and grease on them, uh, you're not supposed to walk on her living room rug. Now, you say, Pastor, I thought you said you could make yourself at home. Yeah, you could make yourself at home, but it'd be disrespectful to trash the rug, wouldn't it? There are certain things, you know, um, there, you couldn't throw wild parties that bother our neighbors. It wouldn't be because you're not welcome in our house. It's just that we don't want to have bad testimony with our neighbors. So there's certain behavior, right? Wouldn't it be true at your house? There'd be things that you shouldn't do. You, If you had me staying at your house, you probably would not want me under normal circumstances to rebuild engines in your living room or to wash engine parts in your kitchen sink. Now, I'm not saying that never happens in our house, but probably you wouldn't want it to happen in your house. And so there are just things that, you know, would be right. Well, there are individuals that take the statement that we have boldness to enter into the holiest, but they kind of scratch out the whole concept of holiest. And they bring unholy into the throne room of God. There are many individuals that take being free and having victory for sin and they make it to mean that they can do whatever they wish and still come into the presence of God. That isn't, that isn't acceptable, is it? There are also individuals who uh, warp praise to God. I'm going to just make some statements this evening, not singling out or picking on anybody or not against anybody. If you think I'm thinking about you or anyone you know, I'm not. I'm just telling you things that have occurred to me uh, in, in time past and that are generally true and apply to anybody where, you know, it's the old, if the shoe fits, then wear it kind of thing. So if it applies to you, that's all right, but I'm not picking at you. But you know, worship music today mostly is irre irreverent, isn't it? Yeah, have you ever been to the Christian bookstore and just try to put on the headphones and listen to worship music? You know, you see these guys on the on the cover of an album and they got the big gold chains on and they got their pants sagging and they're gangsters. And you and you listen to it and they're they're gangster rapping for Jesus and they even dropping some curse words every now and again. And they think because they put Jesus' name in it, that music which represents um, rape and uh, crime is okay. It's worship. It isn't. Rap music represents and means what it means and it doesn't belong with holy, does it? Death metal. I mean, people that are fixated, fascinated with death and with evil. And, and you know, death metal is very, very closely connected with Satanism and occult. Everybody knows that, right? Well, the people whose music is, they know it. You know, you don't just put Jesus' name, Jesus' words in Satan's music and it all of a sudden translates, right? And we could just go down the different genres and styles, uh, but oftentimes, you know, where, where is praise meant to be directed? What, when we sing songs of praise, when we sing our hymns this evening, where were we directed toward? Were we singing to each other? I wasn't singing to you, I was singing with you to God. And so, boldness, yes. You know, the truth is, is that in and of myself, I'm scared to sing to God. I'm scared to talk to God. You understand what I'm saying? Was, I'm afraid of God standing in my own strength. But because of Jesus Christ, I can have boldness and I can praise God. And I can sing to God, but it doesn't make Him less holy. I just wanted to mention, that's a caveat that's an aside here, so we are supposed to uh, very, very boldly access God, but we do not disrespectfully or irreverently access God. Does that make sense to you? Um, I don't like, I don't believe, let me just say, add one more thing to that. I don't believe that formality is the equivalent of respect or holiness either. Oh, thou, my, you know, the these and thous don't, don't make a prayer holy. Right? Speaking in your, you know, nasal voice doesn't make holy. You and I have boldness to God, and so we can speak directly to God. 
You know, sometimes I think we have a lot of clutter in our conversation with God that would be very, very awkward if we were speaking to one another. You know, oh, Brother Charlie, thou who seest me, as I stand before you today, I am coming into your presence to... No, I could just say, hey, Charlie. <laughs> right? You know, a, a lot of clutter, a lot of formality uh, doesn't really... That's not reverence. It's, it's, I think, just sometimes clutter. And so, dear God, you know, Abba, Daddy, my Father, you can talk to God, but talk to God. Now think about what you're saying when you pray. And make what you say meaningful and not just what you think is reverent. Okay? So that's what we have. We have a high priest who's already, who is sitting down. Let us, number one. Okay? We have boldness. So therefore, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. Now that's a long drawn out statement, but it's a good one, isn't it? Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. So don't be doubting, don't be questioning, well is this the only way? Yes it is. Settle the things that you know about your standing, your position with God and understand your rights to God, understand that no other religion is valid, and so go right into God with a true heart. Now, it's not a true heart to pray to God in the wrong place. You're in, a, you're in a synagogue worshiping with people who refuse to receive Jesus. And in your heart, you're praying and saying, God, I know I'm in the wrong place, but I want to acknowledge you in my heart. No, that's not true heart, is it? That's not full assurance, is it? Be in the right place with the right attitude is the first let us. Let us draw near with a true heart and with full assurance and uh, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. Now, how do you like that? What's an evil conscience? Can we just say that it's not a clean conscience? It's not a sure conscience? It's not a confident conscience? Do you remember when the Apostle Paul wrote the letter to the Romans and he talked about meat offered to idols? What was it really ultimately a matter of? conscience, right? It's a matter of, hey, if you feel like this is wrong, that's an evil conscience. If you're not sure it's right, that's an evil conscience. Friend, there's a standard there a lot of Christians misapply. Many Christians want to have clarity, know 100% for sure it's not necessarily wrong, but they're not sure it's right. And listen, if there's doubt, the Bible says, he that eateth is, or he that doubteth is damned, if he eat. And so we're not supposed to go into God's presence wondering if we're in sin, wondering if we're right, wondering about anything if it's wrong, or if you don't know if it's right, my friend, get it out of your life. You'll come to a place of better understanding, you'll come to a place of confidence in your faith if when you don't know about something, if you'll say, well, since I don't know about it, and since I'm not confident that it's right, I'm going to go ahead and let it go because nothing is as important as a clean conscience. Don't want to come into God's presence with an evil conscience. There are a lot of Christians who could be sure about things if they just used a standard like that. You know what I've found out is that obedience always precedes understanding. Obedience always comes faith and obedience. Obedience is always the evidence of faith. And obedience always comes before we understand. And there are many things in the Christian faith that we're not confident are good and okay for us. But when we decide and say, God, well, no matter what, I'm going to do what's right, then all of a sudden we get clarity about how we think. And then maybe sometimes it's, well, this is fine for me. But other times it's like, you know what, it's wrong, and here's how I know it's wrong. It's amazing sometimes how when you take something out of your life, how that you can see better without it. Uh, 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 brother, brother Nick that was with us Sunday evening, Brother Al Miller's son-in-law was telling me uh, that since they have gotten antennas, digital antennas, that they've just never updated their TV. They didn't update their TV with an antenna and they realize that they don't miss television very much. Now that's not to say they don't watch things uh, on the internet or 
uh, with with a, you know whatever the methods for playing things on VCR, but they just don't have a television. And they said, you know, one of the things that I realized, he said, the other day I saw something on TV and it was really, really shocking to me. It was amazing to me how bad it was, how evil it was. And I didn't notice it when I used to watch television all the time. And he's not saying that's his conviction. He shouldn't have a TV. He's basically said we just don't have time for it and didn't have value for us. And we realized when we didn't uh, update it that we didn't miss it. But he said, having done that, now when I hear things, all of a sudden it shocks me. I hear things, and before it just didn't even bother me, and now it shocks me. Why is that? Well, because he's got a clean conscience. And he's able to see and hear things clearly. Now, that's just an illustration. I'm not preaching about television this evening, and I'm, not, uh, I, I'm, I'm only using an illustration to help us understand what it is to have your heart sprinkled and have full assurance of the faith and uh, have a bodies washed with pure water. We're supposed to be clean when we come into the presence of God. That's why it's important for us when Jesus, remember when His disciples asked Him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught His disciples? And what did Jesus say? Our Father, which art in heaven, that it's, not a, it's not the words, it's the concepts in the prayer, hallowed, you're holy, be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in, on earth as it is in heaven. Uh, give us this day our daily bread, and next... Forgive us our trespasses. We're supposed to be clean when we come into the presence of God. And how do we do that? That's 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And what the Holy Spirit here is saying is for you people that are afraid to pray and ask God forgiveness because you don't feel like you deserve it. Nobody deserves it. Amen. But you feel like, oh, I can't come into the presence of God. I can't pray. No, Come into God's presence. Go with full assurance. Get your heart sprinkled and pray and ask God for forgiveness for the things in your conscience. In other words, here are people who have really insulted God. Think on this. Okay, you've been saved. You've tasted, as Hebrews 6 talks about, of the heavenly gift. You've tasted of having the Holy Spirit of God in your heart. You've had the thrill of being a Christian. And now you've gone back into Judaism. What's well, a little something to come dragging yourself right back into the church house, isn't it? How do you feel when you've been living in the world and you try to come back into the fellowship with God and with believers? Do you see how practical this is? The Holy Spirit is saying, you come back. You come right on in. You just get cleaned up and you come right on in. That's our context this evening. Let us draw near with hearts of full assurance, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. If we confess our sins, God, I strayed away. God, I was following Judaism. I was, I was worshiping angels, and I know Jesus is the only is better than the angels. And God, I was content to have a position of uh, being under the law when you've made me a son. I was content to have a sinner that needed to offer sacrifice for himself for a priest when Jesus Christ was a priest, ordained, sworn with an oath, after the order of Melchizedek. And friend, when you've done that kind of nonsense, you feel kind of low down and dirty and mean coming back in the presence of God, don't you? feel like an ornery critter. But the truth is, is God says, clean up and come on in. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. Isn't that thrilling that God says, come right into my presence, you dirty rascal. <laughs> Clean up. If you confess, we confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God says, clean up and come on in. You know, it's sort of like there's a washroom before you come in. Mm. You know, in the washroom is that ability to go in the presence of Jesus. Friend, don't believe the devil's lie. You're no good. You failed God. Friend, that's a given. You were no good before God saved you and He loved you anyway. You failed God, and you're a failure anyway. But friend, because of what Jesus has given, you have boldness, rightful access. And so clean up and come on home. Don't you love the story of the prodigal son? Mm. Father looking down the road. The story of the prodigal son is a story of the father, by the way. It's not about the boys, it's about the father. 
The father's looking down the road hoping his son will come home. When his son came, he went and met him. He didn't say, well, I'm going to see if he's going to come all the way and he better come up and he better say the right thing and he better say the right thing and I'll see if I'll forgive him. He went running to meet him. Put his robe on him, put his ring on his hand and had a feast for him. Because that's the attitude that God has even toward these individuals who Jesus has done so much for and has abolished the covenant for and they've gone back into the old covenant when they've got a new covenant. And God says, come on in. I want you in here. My friend, God wants fellowship with you. Does He need to do anything more to prove it to you besides giving His Son? Besides offering forgiveness for sins for the believers? Could it be any plainer? Could it be any clearer? Let's look at a couple more lettuces and we'll be done. Verse 23, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. You ever heard the statement? I kind of like it. It's not in the Bible anywhere. But never doubt in the darkness what God showed you in the light. It, it, it really applies in a lot of ways. You ever been in doubt, time of doubt in your life? And what the statement means, and it's just a statement, but the, the scripture here I think is indicative of that same statement, is that, you know, when... The Holy Spirit of God thrilled your soul with truth. God met you there. Remember that. And the day when you're cold or the day that you're not feeling something, remember what you knew when you knew it. Does that make sense? Never doubt in darkness what God showed you in the light. You know, sometimes when we, when we serve the Lord, you know, every time you live for Jesus, every time you do anything for Jesus, you're going to have opposition. Do you think opposition feels like a time of darkness or a time of light? It's always darkness, right? It's the valley of the shadow of death for you. You're, gonna have, you're not going to feel good when you're going through those hard times. But know that God's called you. Know that you're in the right place doing the right thing and just go with what you knew. You say, I don't feel it right now. Well, you know it before, so just remember what you felt before. And so now here, the Scripture says, that let's, let's just hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. Don't deter. Well, Pastor, you know, I just didn't feel what I felt when I first started coming to church. Well, friend, maybe there's some things wrong that you can get right and that will help you and when you're right with the feeling. But don't stop doing right just because you don't have the feeling for doing right. Let us draw near... Uh, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for He is faithful that promised. Now, do you see the do you see the statement and how how right it is, how correct it is? Well, I've been unfaithful to God, but He's faithful that promised. Mm -hmm. In other words, we don't move forward in our faith because we're faithful. We go forward in our faith because He's faithful that promised. Well, I'm just going to quit. I'm a loser. I'm a whatever. Well, when was it ever about what you did? It's always been about what Christ has done for us. That's why we live for Him. We don't live for Him because of our commitment or our promise or something that we've done. We love Him because He first loved, first loved us. And He's faithful that promise. God's faithful. And so don't quit. Don't quit. I wish I could tell all Christians, don't quit. Anytime God has shown you that you ought to move forward or you ought to continue in a direction, never stop. Never quit. Never waver. Uh, he's faithful. That promise. So hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. And then the last statement, the last let us. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Now how many of y'all wish there were more folks here this evening? Do you know that it brings me joy when you walk through the door? And do you know when you don't walk through the door, the opposite happens? It's really true. I mean, it just makes my day when I see you, and it doesn't make my day when I don't. Uh, I hope it's the same for you when I'm here. What's it like when I'm missing, when I'm gone? Is it the same? It isn't the same, is it? Why? Well, because it matters that I'm here. My part, my contribution, not only because I'm pastor, but because I'm your brother, because I'm part of this assembly, my part matters, as does yours as well. And so the Bible says, let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works. 
I told someone this the other day, and I don't remember who it was, maybe it was one of you, uh, I can't remember, but I told someone the other day uh, that when you fall back, others fall back. Do you notice that when one person misses the assembling that many people miss? I wasn't here a couple of weeks ago, but when I was out of town, were other people gone too? The riffles are gone tonight, and it just seems like when, when one's gone, others are gone. There's something about falling back that provokes others to do the same. It just is like, well, if he's not going, I might as well not go. There's something about that. And the opposite is also true. Well, if he's going, I think I will too. I don't know how many times I've been somewhere with somebody, and they're like, oh, what are you going to do that? Well, you know, I guess I'll go along. I'll do that too. You know what that is? It's provoking one another unto love and good works, isn't it? And you know, you as a believer either discourage the brethren or you encourage the brethren, but you always do one or the other. There just isn't anything neutral in it. Notice it says, the way to do that, part of the second let us statement, let us provoke one, consider one another, provoke one another into good works, and it, it goes on to say, not forsaking the assembling of, our, of, ourselves, of yourselves together, as the manner of some is. Well, what's the assembling? Well, uh, the word there is episynagoge. Synagogue is a gathering, gathering place. Epi is gathering together, or the gathering together. That is the churching of the church, if you want to say it. It's the gathering together of the believers. And the Bible says that you're not to forsake the gathering. Now, the word for forsake is a word that's like to leave someone in a lurch. Has anyone here ever participated in a really good tug-of-war match? By really good, I mean there's a mud pit. <laughs> right? That's a good tug-of-war. Right? When there's a mud pit. And, uh, you know, there's a strategy in tug-of-war. Yeah, especially when there's a mud pit. And the strategy is to not get muddy. There's two ways to do that. Two ways not to get mud on you. One way is to make sure that your team's the one that pulls the other team into the pit. The other way is to let go of the rope and let your team get dragged into the pit and you don't go with them. <laughs> and that's leaving in a lurch. That's the lurch. It's a pulling. As believers, we have a hold of the rope and we're pulling together. A local assembly is pulling together. Do you realize that you have a common purpose with the people here that isn't the same as your connection with anyone else in our city? In other words, we have a universal purpose in our church, don't we? It's a shared purpose. It is all of our purpose. And the Bible says, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together. And literally what it's saying is, don't let other people get yanked into the ditch because you let go of the rope. That's the idea. <clears throat> Leaving in a lurch. It's on a, if you're on a ship and everybody you know is pulling on a rope together and they're going, heave, ho, heave, ho. It's the guy hoeing when he's supposed to heave or not heaving when he's supposed to hoe or whatever it is. It's not being with the brethren. It's really important for you and for me to work together. We don't work against each other in the body. Man, you see somebody and maybe they're just struggling, they're not doing a very good job, you come and get a hold of the rope with them. You don't criticize them, you don't attack them. You get a hold of the rope and you pull with them. You see, the church isn't doing a very good job. And instead of saying, you know, this church could be so much better if and if and if and if, you get a hold of the rope and you help make it better. I can't do much about the things that people tell me are problems in our church without the person that has the eyes to see the problem grabbing hold of the rope and helping with it. You know, some of you have a better perspective about some things than I do. And you can bring your perspective and I can acknowledge it, but the reason you have a better perspective is because God gave you eyes to see something. And why did He do that? So that you could heave and hoe. So you could get a hold of the rope and pull with us. You ever been on a sailboat where it takes several people to pull up a great big mainsail? What, happen <laughs> what happens if you're directly pulling without any kind of turning around a, a uh, what do they call it, block and tackle it, or whatever? What okay, so five guys are pulling down on a rope, and four guys let go. What happens to the one guy hanging on? He's going for a ride, right? And as believers, that's a terrible thing to do to one another. And so here there's a little bit of a guilt trip put on believers who would go back. First of all, they're told, hey, listen, come back in here, you. 
Come in with a clean heart, with a clean conscience, with your heart sprinkled, full assurance of the faith. You come back in. And you be confident when you come back in because you can be forgiven. God's faithful. And then remember, it isn't all just about you. It's about the brethren. Remember how it discourages the brethren when you forsake him. Not forsaking the assembly of yourselves together as a manner of some is, but so much the more as you see the, the day approaching. And here the scripture is saying, do more, not less. Get more involved, not less involved. It breaks my heart when somebody comes and says, you know, Pastor, we're going to take a step back. You ever heard somebody say that before? We're just going to have to take a step back. You know, we're going to have to step back and evaluate and, and uh, figure out where we're at and whatever. Friend, if God ever showed you to do something, don't ever step away from it. Now, I'm not saying God doesn't change your trajectory or direction or God doesn't move people. But don't ever go back from serving God. Don't ever go back from something God's shown you. And so, that's the last lettuce that we're going to look at this evening. And so we'll just pray. Father, thank you so much for what you've shown us. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to be able to have it in our minds in a really practical way. God, that first of all, we can confidently uh, come into your presence and have access. And that God, uh, we can not only do that, but we need to do so in a way that we see that the day's approaching. The day of destruction for Jerusalem for these individuals, but also the day... God, that we're going to stand before you in the judgment. We pray that you'll help us to see and believe this now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Amen. Let's take prayer requests tonight. Hey, little buddy. I'm so sorry. You don't need to be sorry. That's just fine. We're glad you're here. I thought you had a funny cell phone.